Inside Outer Limits is a regular feature on the Paranormal UK radio network. Chris Evers, Philip Mantle, Inside Outer Limits Radio Show, Flying Disc Press, Outer Limits Magazine, endorse any of the products you may have heard advertised at the beginning or the end of this show or inserted into the middle of this show. The only products we do endorse are those that are strictly affiliated to Outer Limits Magazine or to Flying Disc Press. We now hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello everybody once more and welcome to another edition of the Inside Outer Limits Radio Show with myself, Chris Severs, the man from Outer Limits magazine, and of course, he's better known as UFO royalty, you know, the one and only Mr. Philip Mantle, my co-host. Hi, Phil. Good evening, Chris. Hi, Phil. I bet you're fed up now this week, aren't you? Well, I'm I'm a bit... uh, It's been a busy old week. (laughs) Well, the reason I'm saying that is because your old friend has raised its head above the parapet again, hasn't it? Yes, yes, the the infamous alien autopsy film rides again. Yeah, that's correct. It's um, I understand Ray Santilli has or did have it up for auction, a piece of the the film with no code numbers on it or anything like that, from what I understand, claiming it was the real thing and he had CIA documents to prove it, sir. It's actually gone up on sale again, Chris, as we speak. I, see. I, think, I think it's running its its last hour. Um. For those that are not aware, he, Santilli put a, one film frame uh, up on the, uh, uh, an auction site. Called, I think it's called Rarible. And uh, the, he, the starting bid he wanted you to bid for was $1.1 million. That was the starting bid. I actually sent him a, an email and offered him a fiver. And then I upped it to a tenner. And so that was my last that was my last bid. <laughs> and and he, he replied, he, he you know, he, he saw the funny side of it. But, um, of course, his business partner, Gary Shufield, and him have appeared on a couple of podcasts, both telling completely different stories. When you're going to tell a lie, isn't it important that you both tell the same lie? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, of course, people asking me the same old questions I've been asked for years about it. So in the end, I just got to the stage where I said, yeah, just read my book. It's all in there. Yeah. N- not to sell books. It's just I, I can't fit up answering the same questions. Well, that's why I thought you'd be fed up this week, mate. <laughs> well, it would just, you know, it's all, you know, this damn film's never going to die. And there's more to come. I don't know what, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm only guessing, but there's something behind this. Um, the CIA documents that Santilli says prove it to be real are not from the CIA. There were an email thread, um, a private email thread to to uh, Robert Bigelow involving Dr. Christopher Kit Green. Yeah. And they were talking about the alien autopsy film back in 2000. Well, you know, since then, Kit Green and others that I mentioned in it have, have, re- have recanted their statements. They now believe it's a fake. I even got a statement the other day from from Green again saying, you know, it's a fake. Mm. But, uh, you know, uh, and it's never stopped Ray Santilli in the past and, 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 you know, it won't stop him again in the future. There'll be something else up his sleeve, Chris. I don't don't know what. I don't doubt that for one minute, Phil. I really don't. He's... um... He knows how to play the system, doesn't he? He does. He does. I've I've got thoughts on things, but they're only they're only ideas. We'll yeah. see what happens. See, my personal thought was that because we have this um, release under the COVID nineteen relief bill uh, from the US uh, any time this month, actually June twenty twenty one. I'm thinking, is he is he trying to make a last book on it because he knows something's coming out, or or he's, he suspects something's coming out regarding the Roswell incident? Uh, you know. I, w- I would go the uh, con- a completely different tack. You know, Spiros Malaris is the man who who, who made the film, who, who dreamt it up on, and Santilli was the promoter. Spiros has got legal proceedings in the mix, the mm-hmm. details of which I don't know entirely. I, I just know it's legal proceedings. And I was wondering if Santilli 
uh, if he had to appear in court, I, and again, I don't know the the, the, uh, the you know the legalities of this. If he appeared in court and said, "Well, I sold it. I don't have any film. I, I put one frame of it up for sale, and Mister X came and bought the lot." Yeah, yeah. Uh, under the proviso that I, uh, I I don't release his name. I don't know if that is a legal thing because you often hear at Christie's and the other big auction houses, you know, we had a telephone bid from Japan and it's an undisclosed buyer yeah, for something. Yeah, that's, right. I, 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 that's just my thoughts on it, you know. But anyway, we'll see, won't we? Well, I think uh, if he does end up in court, he's most probably going to send Aid Edmondson because I think Aid Edmondson and Ray Santilli are twins, to be honest with you. <laughs> a bit like the Kinsellers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Anyway, Phil, we, we've got a guest again with us this week. Could you want to tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, the gentleman whose work I've, I've followed on and off for a number of years now uh, is Robbie Graham. I mean, Robbie's been around for, for a number of years. He's uh, a writer, editor, publisher. Uh, Robbie runs August Night's Press, which is an imprint of White Crow books. Mm-hmm. Um, Robbie, like myself, publishes both... Uh, new manuscripts and has some classic uh, what I consider classic books that have, have recently gone on sale I think certainly this is just my humble opinion if you are interested in the abduction phenomenon it should be for you to be classic time by us so without me saying any more uh, welcome Robbie good evening thanks guys it's uh, good to be chatting with you hi Robbie thanks for joining us um, what we normally do is we we normally start with you know who who is Robbie Graham? How did you get involved with the subject? Tell us all about that. Well, um, I've been interested in in UFOs and weird phenomena since I was a little kid, really, just through natural curiosity. And a friend of mine had a close encounter when he was seven years old, when I was seven years old, and he came into school and told us about it, and he's parents had been involved and I later investigated that case when I was sort of 18, 19 years old. I went and sort of uh, spoke to the adults in the case. It turned out to be quite a, you know, um, pointed close encounter of the second kind, but that captured my imagination as a kid. And by the time I was about 14 years old, I sort of deeply uh, uh, sort of invested myself in, in, in the UFO literature and mythology. And by the time I was in my late teens, I'd read a lot of the the major literature on the subject, and I was completely obsessed. And then, um, and then that interest in UFOs sort of gave way or subsided to a, a developing interest in film and cinema and media that I was doing at college. And um, by my mid twenties, I decided to combine those two interests um, uh, of cinema studies and uh, and UFOs. And approached the UFO angle through the lens of cinema, which ultimately led me to write a book called Silver Screen Sources, mm. Sorting Fact from Fantasy and Hollywood's UFO Movies, which was published in 2015. And um, so since but since around 2011 was when I started to write um, in a focused way about UFOs in Hollywood. That's been my bag, really. That's been my kind of shtick within the UFO mm. community is, is looking at UFOs through the lens of media and specifically entertainment media. And then in 2017, I published my second book, which was UFOs Reframing the Debate, which was an edited volume um, of essays written by sort of people who were coming at this subject uh, of UFOs from slightly um, obscure, oblique angles, trying to ask more interesting questions than the ones that are generally asked in order that we could, well, reframe the debate surrounding the subject and uh, make it a little bit more expansive um and seek to i i think that the our perceptions of the phenomenon have been simplified um both through disinformation tactics on the part of various government uh, bodies but also um through hollywood's engagement and representation uh, of the phenomenon as well so i think um it's sort of so reframing the debate was an effort to ask bigger questions of of the phenomenon and see how it ties into other seemingly unrelated phenomena like you know paranormal activity poltergeist yeah. phenomena um, even cryptozoological phenomena as well and and also crucially human consciousness and the human mind and the role that the individual perceiver plays in shaping the experience especially when it's a close encounter experience mm. 
Excellent. I'm, I'm going to ask you, have you had any, as far as you're aware, any UFO experiences, close encounters, uh, or anything like that yourself? As far as I'm aware, I've not had any sort of really profound um, UFO or paranormal encounters or experiences. I've seen a handful of unidentified flying objects at, at a distance in the sky over the years, which I couldn't readily explain in the moment, but which not necessarily couldn't be explained after investigation. But I've grown up around people and, and know people very intimately who have had profound life-changing UFO and paranormal experiences mm. and it's something that I, will, I live with on a daily basis so I understand how it can really affect people's lives and it's something to be treated very very seriously I've always I will I, I mean this is a subject where I was compelled to well I was drawn to it through natural curiosity and through I think with many people at almost a a religious need to believe in something greater than ourselves, and especially something like UFOs and aliens, which can offer a tangible kind of immediate salvation to to the problems of humanity, you know. And 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 I think that's a lot of what attracts people to the subject in the first place. It's not like, you know, it's for a, a, a more rational sort of materialistic mind, UFOs are, pre are a preferable belief to God in the modern age because there is, seems to be some, you know, a lot of science, or at least some science supporting the existence, the physical reality of this phenomenon. And therefore, within that is the promise at some point of some kind of proof and disclosure and deliverance or salvation. And, uh, and I think that whether, we're, whether we are consciously aware of it or not, that is a big factor at play in people's attraction to the subject. And it certainly wasn't with, with me. Um, and so we get particular ideas in our mind about what the phenomenon might represent, even if, whether we've seen it or not. And, and in my experience, even the people who've experienced it close up and, you know, very directly and profoundly are no better informed about what the phenomenon is mm -hmm. than the people who haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And I realize that might be a controversial statement to make and some people might get annoyed by that. Well, this um, is one thing. Sorry, Robbie. Um, this is one thing me and Phil have discussed before in that we're, we're not investigators of UFOs. We're investigators of UFO reports. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is it. I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's I think people are often tempted to come to very solid conclusions about the nature of the underlying phenomenon or phenomena um, without adequate without adequate evidence to, to show exactly what it is. And I, don't, I think we're very far away from understanding what it is. I think, you know, the, 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 the popular narrative within the UFO community is that we're dealing with an extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial intelligence is traveling here from other star systems in nuts and bolts spacecraft and performing experiments and different types of um, surveillance and research on and around our planet. And on the face of it, that's a logical... Um, theory when you know, when, you know and, it, and it can apply to many of the reports on the face of it that, that you know that come in over the years of, of, of ufos but when you look at it in more depth and with a really open mind you'll i mean i think it's unavoidable to to recognize that there is something much broader and more profound even than just alien visitation potentially happening here um and i i think it points to not only to i think the phenomenon is pointing not only to the idea that we're not alone in the universe, but to the strong possibility that we've fundamentally misunderstood the nature of our reality um, and that we could be dealing with a whole spectrum of, of bizarre phenomena, interdimensional beings, intelligences. I mean, even indigenous intelligences that we're not even aware of. Yeah. We, know no, we know nothing about, we know virtually nothing about human consciousness, very little about human history, ancient human history. We're, we're, we're monkeys with machine guns at this point in the 21st century. And we think we're the pinnacle of all intelligence in the universe, but we're, we're nothing. We can't even conceive, I think, of what of what we're dealing with. We're scrambling around for answers and very desperate to come to solid conclusions. But I think it's uh, I think I think, and I think even the powers that be are in largely the same position. They have more money to throw at the, at the subject in secret, and will have undoubtedly reached a number of tentative conclusions. But ultimately, I think the reason that disclosure, so to speak, has been so hard um, for so long is because how do you disclose what you don't know? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that, you know, just because you might have some incl inclination as to what we're dealing with doesn't mean that you can then answer the 10,000 questions that follow. Yeah. Um, 
you know. And I think you've got some fascinating points there, uh, Robbie. I really do. Going back to to um, what you're saying regarding uh, mankind and religion and that kind. Of, I, I I know a gentleman. I, I won't mention his name, but his his <clears throat> his sole uh, purpose, his sole reason, he became involved in uh, the UFO subject. Uh, and it it was a, a lot of years after before I, I, I found this out was that his son had a terminal illness mm. and he was literally hoping to make contact with the aliens in the hope that they could, you know, save his dying son. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I found it very sad indeed when it, when I, if he just let it slip out one day. I'd known him for a number of years uh, and, and, that, and that's what he said. He was looking for, you know, a, a cure for his son's uh, illness mm. uh, as, as far as... Um, his involvement was concerned. And um, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, um, I remember reading uh, Silver Screen Sources, and back in the 1980s, there was a, I'll call it a theory, if you want of a better phrase, Robbie, uh, a theory that the powers that be, the government, whoever whoever they they are, were working in cahoots with Hollywood uh, and manipulating the, the narrative uh, with regards to the release of UFO stroke alien films in general. For example, back in the 1950s, a lot of the films were of missed invasion from space, but then the been changed. And, and a lot of the films were now of aliens of aliens, you know, like E.T., for example. Do you think there's any substance to that at all? Or is it, was it just, you know, one of those theories that floats around every now and again? We were, we were being prepared, in other words, for, they didn't call it disclosure in those days, it was called something else, but the truth was going to be let out. So we were all being prepared because we'd all been watching nice alien films. Would this be Operation Right to Know, Phil? Well, that was no. Well, that was that was around that same time, yes, yeah, yeah. in the 1980s. But it was a theory that we, we as a population, were being prepared for, the, you know, disclosure, as you would call it today. Yeah. And one of the ways we were being we were being prepared was through the medium of of you know nice alien films. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> this is um, this is one of the reasons really why I set out to write the book because. There's, there's always been, in my experience, a lot of discussion about the relationship on a surface level between UFOs and, and Hollywood and, and, and is Hollywood uh, working towards some kind of acclamation agenda, preparing us for some kind of greater reality? And if so, how does that work? And so the, I've got a whole chapter in the book in Silver Screen Sources called A Hollywood UFO Conspiracy? Question mark. And it's look at trying to unpack this idea of a Hollywood UFO conspiracy and what do we even mean by that question? And so in order to, to look at this properly, you have to sort of um, look at Hollywood as an institution, as a business. But you also have to look at its history with the intelligence communities and the military as well. Um, and then you have to look at documented histories of UFO disinformation specifically and how those things seem to repeat and go in cycles across the decades. And so let's start to identify certain themes, uh, potentially agendas, uh, that are at play here. Now, um, so it's not a conspiracy, the fact that the CIA had began to aggressively um, uh, infiltrate the American news media and entertainment media beginning in the early 1950s, as early as 1951, but in a really serious and concentrated way in around 1953 onwards. Um, this is all documented in the CIA's, CIA's own declassified materials now, and you can see how, how aggressively, going way back to the early 50s, they were seeking to basically get their hands into every um, every aspect of American news media, both factual and fictional. Um, so they had relationships with the the editors of all of the major newspapers, magazines, new, um, TV stations, um, you know, wire services, everything. They'd, they'd really, really managed to... Because you don't need to have thousands and thousands of agents. You don't have to have everyone in the Hollywood studio working as a CIA operative in order to control the content of that studio. All you need to do is you need to have assets, people who are sympathetic to your cause or who can be paid off, often it's unpaid it's often it's just people who are doing things for 
the the sort of the um the ego trip of being able to do things in secret for the cia and and, and you also get doors open for you and and certain favors um in return but at some but in often cases people are actually paid for it as well but you don't need many people within these organizations to make this work you simply have to have individuals of influence within at certain choke points points of influence within within these industries and then their decisions um get followed you know those decisions then sort of uh, trickle down through through the, uh, the through the system and are reflected in final products whether it be you know an article or a news report or even a movie and so very early on the cia and other agencies the u.s military as well recognized the immense power of cinema which is still at this point a relatively new medium. It had only been around for around 60 years or whatever by this point. Um, and people were still exploring what the medium could do. But it was recognized that cinema was an immensely powerful medium. When you combine narrative, a story about something, which is essentially a simplified, digestible um, story about the world, which itself is undigestible and doesn't make sense and so we, were, we we rely on narratives to make sense of the world around us especially when it's dealing with a subject that's really hard to understand like ufos so if you can simplify ideas surrounding a complex subject and present them in a narrative um and then anchor that narrative with to to powerful images which the cinematic medium can offer like no other moving powerful iconic images you can really start to have a, a deep impact on how people perceive a particular phenomenon. And so in the early years, the CIA recommended through their Robertson panel initiative that the UFO phenomenon should be debunked and demystified actively through entertainment media and news media. Um, and because they wanted people to, to not believe in UFOs because they felt that belief in ufos could pro be could be problematic for a number of reasons but but um they wanted to actively discourage belief in ufos and so that was the policy that was enacted as in the early 1950s i think that my my, my take on this is that quite rapidly after that was implemented maybe in the maybe as late as the as early as the late 1950s or early 1960s or maybe mid 60s, I think they started to abandon the policy of debunk and demystify because they recognized that it was fruitless. You, you can't convince the world that, the, that a phenomenon does not exist when people from all walks of life every day continue to report it. You can't, you can't convince people that it doesn't exist, but what you can do is you can, you can try to you can try to manage how the public perceives the phenomenon so it becomes less about debunking and demystifying and more about perception management which is much more subtle um, and it can involve you know propaganda disinformation changing your message all the time as well it's about managing how the public perceives the phenomenon and that's and that's that's why things got more complicated over the years and and that's why you've potentially seen mixed messages coming out about the phenomenon and um but when it comes to a Hollywood UFO conspiracy, what we can say for sure is that, yeah, from the outset, almost since the outset, the American government um, have been very conscious of the impact and influence of uh, entertainment media and specifically cinema, TV. And they've sought to exploit that from an early, early stage. And they've done so very successfully, more successfully than I think, than I think anyone would ever believe. Um, what we do have is uh, now... I, I don't. I certainly don't go along with the idea that every movie that's come out about UFOs and aliens has all been some part of some government agenda to pushing some kind of an overarching narrative. That's not the case at all. And anyone who knows anything about cinema, who's ever done any industrial research or had any industrial experience, knows that's not how the industry works at all. And but what you what you do have is a number of cases which I document in my book, going back to the 1950s, where the U.S. government has shown. A, an explicit, very keen interest in, in UFO-themed productions that Hollywood has been putting out. And in a number of cases, they've sought to censor those productions or change the content in line with the Robertson panel's recommendations, essentially, trying to debunk and demystify. But in a number of cases, as the years went by and as the policy seemed to shift and it became more about perception management, there are a number of very compelling cases where the US military and the CIA has involved themselves in UFO themed productions um, in Hollywood in an attempt to, it, well, what would seem to be an attempt to test the waters to see how, how people react 
to certain information or ideas. And certainly in the early 1970s, there was an example where the U.S. where the U.S. military um, gave its full backing to a documentary that was intended to acclimate the public to UFOs, really, and that at one point was allegedly going to even show real alien landing footage. And I'm referring here to the Robert Emenegger um, footage or case of the of, uh, early 1970s where he made a documentary called UFOs Past, Present and Future. But that documentary was fully supported, encouraged and instigated by every branch of the US military, by the US Air Force. It was signed off on by the head of the Air Force at the time. Um, it was it, They were briefed on the project in a CIA briefing room, given unprecedented access to military bases. And the goal apparently was to, was to make the public believe that that this is all real and this came just two or three years after the closure of project blue book so it's you know it's 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 confusing on the face of it when they when they'd shut down blue book in 69 and said there's nothing to this phenomenon we're not interested and then two or three years later the air force then privately and quietly approaches some documentarians and says we want you to put this completely different message out so um, there are a number, and, uh, but there are a number of cases going right up to present day. I mean, and, uh, of the military working hand in hand with Hollywood on UFO related uh, UFO themed productions for, for for film and TV. It goes on. It's more than ever now. I would say. I mean, uh, more 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 than ever. Um, there used to be a policy in in uh, in the, within the Pentagon that any filmmakers who were seeking cooperation from the Pentagon on anything that was remotely UFO related were automatically denied cooperation. On the grounds that you know Blue Book was shut down and the military officially had no interest in the subject, so they would typically blanket deny any requests from filmmakers for any um, UFO themed, you know, for, for any support on UFO themed products. But that policy has completely changed now, and, and they're more than willing to lend their full support to overtly UFO ufological uh, films and TV shows. So, um, but I think we've entered a completely new chapter in the whole history of, of all of this anyway now since since 2016, 2017. With the uh, the Pentagon so-called revelations. <laughs> I, I like that word so-called. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're telling us they're telling us what they want us to know, and nothing more. That, that uh, there's, there's there's nothing organic about what's happening here. Uh, they're giving the impression that the handful of individuals like Luis Elizondo and stuff have suddenly taken it upon themselves to have the initiative to blow the whistle, and there's a chain reaction started, and there's this. You know, not, that's not true. I mean, this is this has been planned. All of this is planned. Elizondo is. I mean, I'm, I'm very confident. To, and anyone who thinks otherwise just hasn't done any research on the history of the intelligence community, counterintelligence, disinformation campaigns, UFO history in general. Really, I mean, it's it's so blatantly obvious what's happening here to me. Um, and it's not. I'm very worried about it. I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm very concerned about what's currently unfolding. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I just view uh, Lou Elizondo as the latest incarnation of um, Major Donald Kehoe, to be quite honest with you. Well, if, in my mind, he's he's the latest incarnation of Richard Doty. Um, oh. from, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Doty. He's the well, guy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and he's because he's a counterintelligence disinformation operative. So he's, that's what he specialises in. And, and um, you know... The, Anyone who knows, you don't need to know a lot about UFOs to recognise the, the historical seriousness with which the government has regarded it. Um, if any of these people, these Navy pilots, Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, if any of these people were truly acting autonomously and had not been given permission from the highest you know, tower to, uh, to talk about this, they simply would not be talking about it and we would not have heard of any of them. It's all been given the go-ahead. At the, at the highest levels, but it's being made to look like it's a, um, like it's a sort of a almost grassroots kind of a quasi-governmental initiative where they're sort of trying to um, get out what they can. And it, 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 it's, <laughs> look, I mean, when has anything been as it appears with with UFOs? I mean, and it's it's like you know the. The catchphrase from from X Files, one of them is of course trust no one, and that's with good reason. Um, historically, the U.S. government, in particular, the U.S. government's historical relationship to UFOs, historically for 75 years, has been characterised exclusively by deception, disinformation, ridicule, uh, manipulation. Why suddenly then, in 2017, after all those years, did they decide to say, you know what? Let's just be completely transparent and honest. Tell them everything we know. Let's get this information out to the public for the betterment of human of humankind. I mean, what 
this is this is this is serving an agenda. What's happening now is that they are there are agendas being served, various agendas, because it's never one thing. There's multiple agendas, and um, you think you're looking at psychological warfare operations against enemy foreign powers, which is why it's no co coincidence that in virtually every single news report that you see now on Fox or CNN or, or whatever, they're talking very casually about, oh, could it be Russian? Could it be Chinese? That's not accidental. And some of them are saying, well, maybe it could, maybe it couldn't. We don't know. But it's putting stuff on the table. And that's all meant, uh, you know, you don't think that the Chinese and Russians are watching this very, very closely. Of course they are. They're watching, they're watching um, all of these news reports all of a sudden thinking, oh, why, is, why, is all, why all of a sudden after 75 years is the American news media now taking this completely seriously? Almost overnight, almost at the drop of a hat. Um, so that's going to be raising questions at their end. What's going on here? Why do they keep talking about Russia and China and these drones? Um, and I wouldn't like to speculate. I just do not know. But but no, what we can firmly say is that nothing is as it appears. And you should definitely not trust or take at face value. You should definitely not take at face value any statement that comes from anyone um, currently or even formally associated with the government on this subject. Because it's just... To, to do so would be madness to to to, to trust <laughs> it's, just, it's just totally counterintuitive so but i think that people's desperate need to have confirmation and disclosure is leading them astray and people are just falling on falling to their knees um for these people and they're, they're treating them as sort of like demigods and heroes of the disclosure movement and they're then they are that they are they're not who they think they're not who they appear to be I don't it's see how like, anyone can see otherwise. It's like Chris was saying, you know, from from Donald Keogh's day, you know, the, the, again, the government were going to tell him everything. I, I remember when I beca became involved in, in the 1980s and, and linking up with Timothy Good, he was saying the same thing then. You know, it, we're going to get the information, it's coming, and then... Was we're still they call it disclosure now. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's same nonsense with a different with a different uh, uh, word attached to it. It's um, constant. Yeah, it's constant perception management. You can put it all under the banner yeah. of perception management. It's all constantly about managing and manipulating and massaging our perceptions of yeah. a phenomenon that is ultimately out of their control. That that you know the powers that be do not have control over whatever the phenomenon is, whatever it represents is beyond our understanding, let alone our physical control. And so if you've got no actual control over the phenomenon, all you can hope to do is control as best you can how people perceive it. Yeah. And 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 also in a way that's that best serves you as an institution, as the government. Because let's face it, the American government's history with UFOs, you know, if we were to really expose it and really get in there, you'd find a lot of Ill illegality and wrongdoing and you know very dark and nasty stuff i expect um and what you're seeing now is to my mind a, a very conscious attempt to introduce a whole new generation but the, the world at large into the concept of uh, the phenomenon that, that there may be that we may be coexisting with a phenomenon that we don't understand i think we may have something along those lines acknowledged. It's quite possible. It does seem that that's the direction we're headed in, that there may be some form of acknowledgement fairly soon that there may be something that's going on that we don't fully understand. Um, and, you know, I, I just think uh, it's... what The thing that, that they need to do, if it, if it were me in their position, I would be very concerned about when you acknowledge that to the public at large, then the questions that that come in, well, what about Roswell? What about Area 51? What about all of the people, the millions of people who claim to have been abducted or had experiences or been threatened or had men in black visit them? Or, you know, all of these things, people, all, you know, you've got a really dark and nasty history with this subject. Seems to me what's happening, if you look at the language that's being used consistently in all of these most recent interviews, on Fox and CNN and the MSNBC, etc., in the New York Times, all of the people. There's only a handful. It's all of the, pen, the chosen Pentagon people, um, maybe five or six people at this point. They're all consistently using the same language, and it's all the language of hostility and threat and vulnerability and um, weapons capabilities. It's all been dominated and monopolized by militarism. Where are the philosophers and scientists 
hooked in this debate? Why aren't they having people come on the TV to talk about all of the, the you know, the, the, the broader, more interesting implications of this beyond just are they are they real and, and can they kill us? Which is exclusively what's being discussed at this point, which is very unhealthy and bears really no relation to, to the phenomenon at all as people, you know, I mean, as we know, people can be injured or hurt um, through close encounter type experiences and um, but there does not seem to be any conscious hostile intent on the part of whatever this is um, it, it, there just doesn't not, not on the whole and that's not to say that experiences can't be extremely terrifying because of course they can but in my experience the people who I know who, who, who have had a lifetime of these experiences even they don't feel it's hostile they, they think you know they don't even claim to know what it, e- what it is even <laughs> that they're dealing with it's usually the UFO researchers who haven't had the experiences who actually try to impose their yes. their view onto the people who've had the experiences. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've, I've been saying that, that recently, and, and not just in general, but on specific cases. And again, I won't mention any names, but uh, there are those that will tell you that, for example, Betty and Barney Hill uh, had an encounter, what, what people call the little grey guys, you know, the greys. But, but of course, if you, you, you just pull one of the books off the shelf and look at what Betty and Barney said, and that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a, a case where it was the UFO researchers distorting what they, they, they claimed to suit their own particular pet theory or, 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 or of, of the nature of the phenomenon. And speaking of which, you know, you've talked about perception management uh, in the we'll call it the entertainment industry. Would that also, in your opinion, lapse over into books, you know, publications? Would the would the uh, the CIA or their count or, or or other agencies have their fingers in that kind of pie as well, as part of this overall perception management? Yeah, it's, again, it's a documented fact that that the CIA really successfully um, around the same time they were successfully trying to. Um, infiltrate not only the world of entertainment media and news media but also academia um, if you want to influence people's minds you then you need to have to get into the top level of academia and get into all of the major universities and yeah absolutely every major university has intelligence connections and ha- and the intelligence world has influence within every single major university um, you know and, and and which is why obviously certain universities produce an inordinate amount of world leaders, military leaders, etc., because they're just factories for a certain type of thinking, a certain type of ideology that's perpetuated um, over the years, which best serves the power elites, because the, the more people you can have who share that uh, your ideology, the more, the more support you're going to have and the stronger your position will be. From well, it's, like, well, it's like the UK. How many uh, uh, prime ministers have come from uh, Eton and places well, of that nature? <laughs> Pretty much all of them, and it's the same with America. Pretty much every president, you know, well, most have, have been to Princeton or, or Harvard or one of the, you know, um, one of the, the the Ivy League universities, and they're they're just yeah, like you know, it's like the, the, the term the old boys club. I mean, you've seen that, you've seen that uh, picture of the Bullingdon Club with David Cameron and Boris Johnson and all of the cabinet who, yep. Yep. Feel, you know, as 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 basically people in their late teens, early twenties at that point. Um, and then go on to, to run the world. And that's just, the, you know, again, that's the way it is. And that's why they get them to... It sounds incredibly conspiratorial, but the, we're, we're increasingly told that, you know, if you... I mean, conspiracy is a really dirty word now. That in itself is fucking suspicious. Sorry, I don't mean to swear. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's, we're we're um, all adults, don't worry. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know what your, uh, what your uh, audience is here. Um, is, uh, is very suspicious because, like, it's becoming it's becoming almost like really dangerous to even openly talk about alternative views of history um, because you're branded with a conspiracy brush and you're like a conspiracy theorist and all of the crazy, the, all of the really crazy stuff that goes along with some of those conspiracy theories. But the reality is that, you know, people, you know, there are societies like the skull and bone society in America where, where they have people like George Bush join and, and they, and the Bullingdon club in, in the UK and, you know, and, and and the and the reason that those so-called secret societies exist is simply to exert control, because the people who join those societies or who are sort of fall into those societies, are 
encouraged to do things and reveal things about themselves, which ultimately can be used as leverage in their political careers. We know that David Cameron, for example, yeah. is going to go on to become prime minister because that's what we're grooming him for. So yeah. let's, when he's a young man, let's make sure that we've got something that we can really, you know, something really embarrassing that, that we can engineer for him, that we can then hold over him in all of the years to follow. David, we've, we want you to pass this bill or we want you to, you know, go along with this particular policy. Oh, I don't really want to do that. Oh, yeah, but David, don't you remember when you were 18 at the Bullington Club? Remember what you did? <laughs> and that's why they have, that's why they do these things. It's, it's that, and people don't want to think about it because it's too disturbing. We people people don't want to think about it, and it, it's this this idea as well. I find it really completely paradox. Well, kind of counterintuitive, almost sort of like the idea that has been in, introduced that oh, people just like conspiracy theories because it's more comfortable to think, it's more comforting to think of the world in those terms. What planet are you on? How is it com- How is it comforting to think that the people who should be taking most care of us don't care about us at all and are complete psychopaths and doing everything everything for their own <laughs> towards their own agendas how is that a comforting thought yeah well it's, it's a bit like um j edgar hoover um i think each president that got elected wanted to get rid of him but of course he had a little little file of secrets about them precisely uh, and precisely. If, i'm sorry if you try and get rid of me well this might find its way into the into the into the news media you don't want that do you i oh, know just go away and tell us how much budget you want to run the fbi and we'll leave you to it precisely you know so, and 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 the, and, the, and the reality is as well you know um that you know in politics high politics business the corporate world we know again psychologically that that those are the work those are the kinds of worlds that attract uh you know not to be sensational about it, in clinical terms psych- psychopaths um, yeah, those, absolutely. Those those industries in that world attract people who are stimulated by power, yeah. and and who crave power and and the limelight and and authority and the, and, and and you know and and they're willing to go on the public stage and to to do billion pound deals before breakfast because it's all an adrenaline rush and that's what you know, psycho and they they don't really have any fear, but they it's very much about themselves build a cult of personality around themselves and so these people are completely self interested. Um, and we like to believe that they're our servants because we've elected them, but in fact they're only serving themselves. I'm, this is, you know, I'm generalising here, and of course, absolutely not everyone in politics and the business uh, in the world of business is like this at all. But it, at the highest levels of politics and, co- and corporatism, you would find it an, in, an, an inordinate, an inordinate amount of psychopaths. Well, you, you've, all, you've only got to see when we had the financial collapse in 2008. And shortly thereafter, you know, they had the, the parliamentary committees set up and they, they they got their top bankers in one by one. And they all said, but you could see they didn't give a monkeys, you know, that they, they, they'd squandered billions and had a, a, a great time in doing it. And, of course, ended up, you know, nearly bankrupt in the, the country. Yeah. And, and and they fit that profile exactly. Uh, but what, what I was also interested in what you were saying, because, again, it cropped up with a colleague I was speaking to literally last night. Um, one one gentleman mentioned the the um, the documentary, The Phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And my colleague said, well, she not have been called The Phenomena. Mm, yeah. Plural. Mm. Uh, and that's something I picked on, picked upon what what you've just been talking about. Can, can you expand on 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 what you mean by phenomena plural when it comes to UFOs, please, Robbie? Yeah. So I was actually talking about this the other day um, to my wife, um, and the phenomenon. So James Fox's film, The Phenomenon, it takes its name from the sort of invisible college, so to speak, uh, of, of ufologists who refer to UFOs, not as UFOs or flying saucers or this or that, but they refer to it as the phenomenon. And that's how it's referred to as well within sort of quasi-governmental circles, the corporate world, this, you know, people like Jacques Vallée and those guys, they refer to it as the phenomenon because it appears, so, so for, and, it, and the phenomenon in their book encompasses UFOs and other phenomena which don't necessarily on the face of it seem to be related but which clearly are related um so a lot of psi psi phenomena um telepathy in conjunction with lights in the sky poltergeist phenomena entity reports strange you know um all sorts of strange phenomena that that sort of 
link together in in ways that disturb people high strangeness and it so the phenomenon refers to that but they, but it also refers to uh the individual's role in creating whatever phenomena that we perceive or filtering those phenomena through our very limited biological perceptual and cultural sort of um programming and so so the phenomenon in that sense refers to multiple phenomena but they i think there is a belief uh, or, or an idea among people like jacques valet who who think that the phenomenon refers to say a control mechanism that he he speculated about in one of his earlier books and which you know he continues to sort of hold this this idea today which is the idea that there is an intelligence more along the lines of the intelligence in to, uh, Stanley, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey movie where you've got this supra omnipotent godlike intelligence which is not necessarily god but which is some kind of super intelligence which can interact with us and manifest in lots of different ways across time and culture and it prods us constantly in strange and mysterious ways to constantly make us think just beyond our comfort zones and just just beyond where we are currently in culturally socially politically um scientifically and so it's this this thing that's constantly nudging us along to evolve and to grow and there's this idea that this phenomenon that we now refer to as ufos is actually historically ancient has been with us for as long as humans have had ideas and it can manifest in different ways in a multitude of different forms and you know including fairies and goblins and incubi and succubi and there's lots of different names for this intelligence you know like the jinn and things like that that it can manifest in different ways and the dominant reception of the phenomenon depends on where people are culturally at any given time um, and scientifically so in the 1800s late 1800s early 1900s people were, were reporting mystery airships um because that was the closest thing that they had to re- that was their, that that was their closest frame of reference to what they may have been seeing and maybe even and maybe even their minds literally you know when when the mind so there's a there's a there's a essay in the in the book uh, that i edited reframing the debate by greg bishop where he talks about the idea of um co-creation uh where again human beings have we are very primitive uh biologically everything we're very primitive uh we don't understand the nature of our own perceptual apparatus yet um we can only we we know that we only see a very slim uh sort of uh slice of of, of a much broader reality all of the different things that are going around us in time and space you know we only perceive a very narrow we're, we're only sort of perceiving a very narrow bandwidth um, and that's partly due to survival and, and the way we've evolved. We don't really need to see and experience so much because it'd just be, too, it'd be overload otherwise for us. And so it's entirely possible there's all sorts of phenomena going on all around us that we just don't recognize because things are on different vibrational frequencies. And and um, so the co-creation thing is the idea that sometimes we are confronted with exotic stimuli that are really truly alien to us that we don't we have no framework of reference for understanding which can pop into our reality perhaps from some other dimension perhaps they're existing alongside us all the time but just on different vibrational frequencies but sometimes boom there it is and we're confronted with some really alien stimulus now what does the brain do in those situations in a close encounter experience well it's rapidly trying to make sense of what it's seeing um, it filters out things. It filters things through cultural frameworks, whether we like it or not. What we expect to see is often broadly what we might see, especially if we have no framework of reference for it. Also, in the retelling of what we experience, again, our, our brains create a story about what we're seeing in the moment almost. And then afterwards, we tell ourselves a story about what we've seen in order to make sense of it. We then tell that story to someone else. And then that person tells that story to someone else. And in each successive telling, the, the, you're getting further and further away from the actual raw experience, which may be beyond conventional human understanding anyway, but the process is that a mythology is created and certain ideas become embedded into the popular consciousness. And and uh, so 
yeah, I can't even, so so the phenomenon. So getting back to your question, so the phenomenon. I think a lot of people refer to the phenomenon as as there is some unknown external, let's say, alien to us intelligence stimuli that interacts with us occasionally, uh, maybe fairly frequently, and that which we spin into something that we can try to understand, but which is not necessarily representative of what was actually experienced. But it does have an intimate relationship with us historically. That's the phenomenon as understood by someone like James Fox in his usage of it. But I, I, I'm not, and and I'm incredibly sympathetic to that hypothesis. But at the same time, I'm not sure that it's incredibly useful to to actually refer to it as a phenomenon in in the singular, because we could very well be de- dealing with with a number of, you know, not entirely related anomalous phenomena that we just um, try to lump together as one. And maybe it's not one. Maybe maybe we are dealing. Maybe we are dealing with maybe the phenomenon is representative of actual extraterrestrial visitation in the traditional sense, but it could also be, it also encompass interdimensional uh, beings coming and going. It could also encompass indigenous intelligences, forces that we don't understand, uh, which has been here as long as we have. It could be things to do with human consciousness that we don't understand at this point, um, as well as a whole host of other weird, you know, phenomena that we don't understand, uh, as well, of course, as, as, you know, black projects and the military and highly advanced technologies and so th- there could be many things going on what going on at once but i think i think it is the phenomenon is probably better than ufos because unidentified flying object i mean we in the conventional sense these things don't seem to fly anyway they, they just because they're moving through the air doesn't mean they're flying in the way that we understand flight like, you know thrust and things like that um but also the strangest reports of these things are typically not in the air. The phenomenon gets really strange when it's on the ground and closer to the witness. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons. It's one of you should mention that, uh, Robbie. Um, the, my next book, uh, it's unpublished as yet, but it, it will be out at some point, uh, deals with landing cases here in the UK. Mm. Uh, and a lot of those are, are up close and personal because it's... Uh, the high strangeness factor is what uh, Heineck talked about. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've taken a, you know, a leaf from his book in that respect. And like you said, some of it is extremely bizarre. Mm. And I mean, you know, there was, there was um, certainly a couple of cases that I, I, I toyed with whether I should include them. They, they, they were that bizarre. I thought, but I had, you know, if I'd have left them out, I would have kicked myself in, in right. the end. But I thought, no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave them where they are, put them in the manuscript, and, and people can make up their own minds uh, rather, rather than me trying to do it for them. Mm. But they were extremely strange. And um, not that long ago, I published a book by uh, Dr. Dan Farkas in, in Romania. Mm. And Dan had it's called hyper civilizations. Dan has his own idea that we are being visited by something from wherever, but it is so far in advance and so different from us that we as a species are simply not capable of of recognizing it and or understanding it. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things that that bothered uh, uh, Dan a lot was what he calls, you know, the stupid things the euphonauts do. Mm. In other words, if these were visiting aliens, they do some pretty damn stupid things. Mm -hmm. And he also talked about, the, you know, the folklore uh, influence and and things of that nature. Um, And and I think he made a a good argument for that. And, um, you know, know, I I think it is, is it is. Fascinating. I've long since said myself, whatever this um, phenomena is, you know, we don't have the answers, and we're nowhere near in 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 finding them. Um, I don't. I'm I'm not even sure we've scratched the surface yet, Robert. No, I don't think so. And I've uh, said I look upon it. Probably our role is to document the information as best we can, in the hope that somebody in the future will be able to make sense of it. That's um, right. 
Yeah. Pretty much like the early, you know, archaeologists did, because they were all amateurs, you know, sticking different bones in the wrong place when they found dinosaurs and all that kind of thing. But eventually, science caught up with them and were able to 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 better understand it, of course. Yeah. And um, so I I I know you've, as, as I mentioned right at the beginning, you've you've branched out into publishing published a whole raft of books, not just on UFOs, but a whole range of what I would call paranormal phenomena. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of my, my favorite books of all time, you've uh, you've beaten me to it. <laughs> you've republished Missing Time. I, re- I remember when Missing Time came out, it was a, a colleague of mine who I uh, had great uh, respect for he's sadly no longer with us he's um, the late hillary evans mm-hmm. and hillary was on, going on a trip to the states the, the book wasn't out in the uk at that point and he he was adamant and so i said get me a copy and i remember it's one of the few books i've read several times yeah and uh, like i said i think if you're involved in this subject it, 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 you ought it, you ought to be made to read it i think it's a fascinating book uh and i'm i'm glad i got to know bud um uh, later as well so tell us a bit more about your publishing side of, of your work if you, if you would please Robbie how did how did that start and why do you choose certain topics and 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 bringing it up to date with Missing Time and Intruders by Bud Hopkins um yeah thanks um I I, I... So in 2017, I wrote the Reframing the Debate book, which was published by White Crow Books, who also published my Silver Screen Sources book as well. And it was through my um, professional relationship with John Beecher, who runs and owns White Crow, that um, August Night came about. In 2017, John said to me, look, I've been thinking about doing a, you know, launching an imprint for White Crow that specializes less in sort of life after death, and spirituality and more in things like you know traditional paranormal phenomena including ufos and we're interested in, in running an imprint you know creating it and running it basically having complete sort of creative freedom and and you know publish whatever books you want however many you want whenever you want and i thought well, that sounds brilliant <laughs> yeah so, i know the feeling um so <laughs> I, but i didn't it took me a while to fully really recognize what a we have been given to me there essentially i mean like i um i was still at that point thinking i want to write more books more of my own books and you know um but it's fantastic because what i've got now is this imprint august night press where so in the first couple of years we published we'd published sort of six books um put them out fairly slowly um focusing more on sort of quite scholarly academic works in the field of anomalistics looking at um you know, mediumship and and sort of paranormal phenomena poltergeists things like that and i put out a few books along those lines which were all very well received critically acclaimed and things but uh, and then so uh, i tried to sort of then continue doing my own writing and and not probably paying as much attention as i should have really to to the the publishing side of things because it was just on the back burner and then i just sort of made a decision a while back that you know this is i've really got something good here with this imprint and um and I've, it's a great privilege actually to be able to um have people's original work and and also out of print work as well and to put and you know to bring that to a whole new generation of of people and to you know to to, to expose people's work to, to thousands and thousands or potentially a lot more than that people and um so it's all about putting ideas out there, isn't it? And so I thought this is a great opportunity. And then um, from the outset, I wanted to look at publishing some classic titles that were out of print um, in addition to new works by new authors. And so we've just started to strike that balance now. So um, as I say, so with with August Knight and Bud Hopkins, it took it took about eight or nine months to negotiate that, that deal with the Bud Hopkins estate. It was not... Uh, it was not an easy process, um, but I recognised that it was worth worth doing because these are historic books. Um, the you know, uh, Missing Time and Intruders are two of the most influential uh, UFO books ever written. I would say I'd put them probably within the top. Certainly, I mean, Missing Time I would certainly put within the top ten most influential UFO books um, because it, that was the that was the book that introduced the term Missing Time into the lexicon of ufology. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. 
and and, and uh, no one was really doing any similar research at the time, and it was Bud Hopkins. I mean, you can disagree with, with the conclusions that he reached, and indeed some of the experiences themselves don't share Bud's exact perspective on it. But they were all very sort of grateful for the, for, for, the, for the time and effort that he put into it and even asking the questions to begin with, you know, what's going on here and recognizing these patterns, um, you know, of, of missing time and, and, and starting to identify the patterns that, that were becoming evident in, in these uh, experiences. And so, yeah, and that ultimately led to, to intruders. And then he brought John Mack into the subject, which led to John Mack's pioneering work as well. So, um yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to. If I'm going to put out books, I want to put out things that have, you know, historical relevance and significance. And so, yeah, we we put those books out um, only last month, at the end of April, um, and uh, and then next next month, in, in the end of June, we'll be putting out a book by Debbie Jordan Corbell, who is the central figure in Bud Hopkins' Intruders. Yeah, um, she's Kathy Davis in the book Intruders, but she's also written her own uh, memoir uh, called Extraordinary Contact, Life Beyond Intruders, which documents her own experiences with UFOs and non-human intelligences, but also with a whole raft of other uh, anomalous phenomena, poltergeists, telepathy, EVPs, life after death experiences, near-death experiences, synchronicities, government surveillance. It's a really sort of dramatic and powerful book, um, and that's that's going to be coming out um end of june and then we've got a couple of others um that are due out as well i've got uh, chris rutkowski the canadian researcher mm-hmm. um he, he's got a new book coming out um it'd be july called canada's ufo files declassified which is going to be sort of the definitive book about canada's um uh, ufo uh, ufo files and a lot of really great material new material in there that's coming out and then um we've got another one by we've got joshua kutchin who's probably best well known for at the moment for his books on on the bigfoot phenomenon where the footprints end but he's a folklorist essentially in in america and he's written some great books and he's put together an edited volume for august night called fairy films we folk on the big screen which is like silver screen sources essentially looking at uh how fairy lore has has influenced um cinema and how creative people in the industry um look to fairy law when i say fairy law i don't mean just like little pixies and things. i mean like the the dark fairy law um mm. uh, which has many crossovers with ufology and, and all sorts of things like that um looking at how filmmakers have engaged with with ideas of you know hidden worlds right next to us and incorporated them into their fictional narratives and so uh yeah that's a that's a like a, a, f- a film folklore book essentially that which is coming out again in july and then we've got another one by Jack Hunter, Dr. Jack Hunter, who um, who's going to write a book for us called Deep Weird, looking at um, high strangeness, just focusing exclusively on high strangeness cases across all the different types of seemingly unrelated phenomena, all the strangest cases from, you know, paranormal fields, cryptozoology, ufology, trying to find a common thread through all of this high strangeness. So... Um, yeah, so we'll have so by July we'll have twelve titles I think and uh, under the August night August night banner, and then I'll just continue to to keep that going over the over the months and years. Well, that's great. I wish you every success with that, Robbie. As, as a as a publisher myself, you know, I know how, how difficult it can be. It was um, interesting as well of note with with Bud Hopkins because Chris and I interviewed uh, I don't know if it was early earlier this year or last year. Uh, a, a British filmmaker called Charlie Parrish, although he lives in in, in Pasadena, lives and works in America. Mm-hmm. And Charlie's working on a film, and he has exclusive access to Bud's uh, archive of material. Mm. And he was here at my house in, in over the Christmas period. He'd come home to see his family, and he showed me a little piece of film he shot on his phone of, of Bud's archive and it was amazing, mm. it really was uh, I mean there's there's a life's work in there uh, <laughs> you know, if you wanted to go through it all, but uh, so hopefully we'll see some of that and, w- and what was interesting uh, regarding Missing Time, I can't remember the gentleman's name but it was like a Eastern European name, was was, was the, the gentleman that first got Bud uh, interested, I think it was his local liquor yeah. store mm-hmm. and um, he's got the the um in a box of tapes first tape he picked up was 
an interview with that particular gentleman. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was trying to get a listen to it, but I, have, I haven't. Uh, I've, not, I've not been successful uh, as yet. But but, uh, but but we'll be getting there. So how how can people find these books, Robbie? Where where, where can they go to get their hands on them? Uh, my books and also all of the August Night titles are all available through any good li- good online bookstore um, in paper book, paperback and ebook formats. They're on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Waterstones, any on- good online bookstore. You can get them uh, pretty instantly. Um, we're starting to look into the possibility of doing some audio books as well, um, but at this point we're we're mainly just doing paperback and ebooks. So you can get them Kindle and all that kind of stuff. So the Bud Hopkins books are available now in paperback and kindle and the um all of the other august night titles are also available and you can go to augustnightpress.com to find all of those titles um and uh yeah so and then as i say we'll be having more coming out over the next few months um including um debbie jordan corbel's um sort of quite hotly anticipated personal life story Mm, uh, that'll be one of, of particular interest to myself i've corresponded with debbie i've never met her um, but, but I have corresponded with her. She wrote a little piece um, for me as well she, when she met uh, Charlie Hickson from the Pascagoula case. Mm. I, have a, I have a photo of her and Charlie together. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, fascinating stuff, mate. I look forward to that. And, and like I say, I wish you every success with this, Robbie. I know it's not easy at times. Yeah. And uh, I know it can be difficult um you know, in negotiations when you're trying to uh, get books that have, have been previously published. Uh, and that's how it all started with with my involvement in the Pascagoula case, of course, is mm. is the book by Charles Hickson and William Mendes. I, I, I obtained the rights to republish that mm. and then ended up speaking to Calvin Parker and, 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 um, and doing two books with Calvin. Although yeah. that was that wasn't the plan, it was just an interview I was after. Mm. But uh, it's amazing how things change. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, no, and, and same to you as well, Philip. You know, it's good. Uh, uh, you know, seeing you putting out uh, so many titles, it's uh, good that you're being so prolific with it and managing to get all of that out. Because, as, as I say, and as you say, it's not it's not an easy process. You know. No, and I don't look upon other publishers as competition. Uh, either I look upon them as you know respected colleagues. Yeah. We're all heading in the same direction. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah no, it's always so, great. It's so we're now at the stage where every well I won't say everyone. A lot of people are waiting for this this report that's supposed to be coming out in, in the in the US. Mm. Do you think they're going to be happy with the the contents of it, or are there going to be a, a huge a, a huge burst of a balloon somewhere? very hard to make a prediction on it um what i what i can say is that again a good barometer here is to look at how the subject is being currently depicted engaged with by the mainstream news media the american news media particularly because whatever's happening here is clearly an american initiative it's not a global disclosure initiative or whatever because the british press have barely touched it um, barely touched it. They begrudgingly did a Newsnight report on it the other day, the other night after a I saw sol- that, yeah. And that was after like two weeks of solid, um, non-stop news media coverage in America. And if they didn't cover it, they would look negligent. So they've sort of begrudgingly said, okay, something's going on in America. We better cover it on Newsnight. But basically, the British press have had nothing to do with anything along these lines, uh, and they're very historically quiet on UFOs anyway, unless it's in a sensationalist way. Um, but in America over the past couple of months especially but it's been going on since around 2017 now but especially over the last few months the american news media coverage of this subject has been unbelievably serious and um and the language that's been used is being sort of quite consistent there's a message that's starting to emerge from all of this and the uh, you're now starting to get mainstream figures um political commentators and debaters starting to openly and unashamedly engage in this now and we're into new territory there's no question about it i've no i've been you know monitoring this subject non-stop since i was like 14 years old and i've never seen anything 
like this in my life, this level. I forget about the 90s and stuff because the 90s was much more of a pop cultural phenomenon that was going on where people were suddenly involved, interested in, in everything. <clears throat> That was the X Files generation. That was the yeah. X Files generation, but you know, but but what was going on in the nineties in terms of pop culture interest in UFOs was not reflected in in government statements about it at all. No, no. But now th- this is unprecedented that you've got the Pentagon officially and quasi officially, but even officially now, starting to say this is real. These things are real. Even President Obama, uh, you know, w- when when he was asked about it the other day on the James Corden show, that was interesting as well. Obama's been asked about this subject several times on TV before, and he's always dismissed it and laughed or said, I can't talk. Well, actually, it's interesting because in previous, in previous, I think the last time he was asked, I think by Jimmy Kimmel or whoever, and they said, can you talk about it? And he, his face changed. And he actually, people look at it as like, oh, he just dismissed it all. But if you look at his face in the previous interview, not the most recent one, when he's asked about it, he says, no, I can't talk about it. And he's dead. He's serious. He, his face changes and the smile drops in his face. He says, seriously, I can't talk about it. But everyone laughed, assuming it was a joke, because that's what you do. You know, you laugh. But he's serious. He's like, I can't talk about it. This time, when asked about it, he said, no, it's all serious. He said, I'm being serious now. And he actually yeah, said, I'm I saw serious. it, yeah. Yeah. He said, this is real. He said, that we, there's something going on. We don't know what it is, and we're, we're looking into it. Now, did you, did you gentlemen see the recent interview with President Biden? Um, he was asked the self same question, you know, what's going to go on, what's going to happen, etc. And he kind of joked it off, dismissed it, and walked away, but left the earphones stuck in his ear, and he had to put it, it pulled on his head, and he had to pull himself back <laughs> to take it out. I, I just laughed when that happened. <laughs> I didn't see that actually. I haven't, I haven't actually seen that, but uh, I'll check, I'll check that out. But he, but what clearly what's happened there is that on a top down level, I mean. And it's not just the you know Obama, but it's it's various. You've had three former CIA directors, like the you had the director of national intelligence. You had um, you had James Wolsey, former head of CIA, and another guy whose name I can't remember at the moment. You had three different top-ranking American national security figures, um, all retired now, but still enormously significant that they're saying this, talking very openly and freely, saying, "Yeah, th- this is." something going on and actually saying we might be dealing with something that's not human they actually said that that's a, that's unbelievable um, and now you've got obama clearly someone said to him yeah you can start talking about it now if we asked about it you can say it's real you can't go too far but you can say that there's something going on and that so the point is, is if you look at all how all of these statements are coming out in the news media and the consistency of the coverage now it's it would seem to be leading towards something it seems that it seems already to have led to a point of no return. I'd say that we're already at a point of no return. Um, and, and now there's a huge amount of anticipation about this report that's going to be coming out. But if you look at all of the, again, if you're the, if you're the secret keepers and you're concerned about how the public might react to some announcement that you're going to make, the best uh, gauge of how people are going to respond is to look at, or a good a good gauge is to look at how people respond in comments on social media, YouTube, all the newspaper websites, and whenever there's any 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 story about UFOs, especially in recent months, uh, the story says you know, well, government might release this or that, or the other. All of the comments, well, not all, but most, the vast majority of the comments are like, tell us something we don't know. We already know this, like big deal, right? Mm-hmm. So, if I were the people in the corridors of power i'd be thinking well what what's the big deal everyone's already expecting this anyway we may as well tell them that something's going on because they already believe it anyway yeah and i I personally think robbie that um anything prior to the tic tac stroke gimbal princeton uh, nimitz footage etc etc that they'll just ignore and they won't comment on that i think they'll only comment on the on the recent since 2017 releases basically I agree completely, and that's what, and that's what, um, again, and that's a completely reasonable conclusion to draw at this point because that's what, that's the message that's that's coming across in all of the, the, in all of the coverage. They're trying to effectively erase UFO history or or their involvement with UFO history, and to rebrand it and repackage it as something that that they're only just becoming aware of, um, and and that makes sense, you know, because you don't want to have to deal with 75 years of illegality and things which generally probably mm. you're not even responsible for anyway. Or the fact, Robbie, that they've lied to us for 70 odd years. That's the, exactly, that's what I'm saying. That's the, that's the exact, that's exactly it. And so yeah. they would rather try to repackage it as something that's fairly new that they're responding to in an open and transparent way. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's why they're, you know, they're referring to UAPs now rather than UFOs, which have got a connotation could, of conspiracy. Could that be why, um, in one of the statements that came from whoever, wherever, uh, alluded to the fact that, uh, as far as the Navy, the US Navy was concerned, they had upgraded their radar. And yep. it was only because of this upgrade that they were now able to mm -hmm. de detect them, monitor them, etc. Mm -hmm. could, could that all be part of it? I think so. I, I, I think, you know, people really need to be less. I agree. Uh, people need to be, when watching these news reports um, with any representative of the Pentagon or anyone associated with the Air Force or whatever, pay very careful attention to the language that's being used. You know, um, a message is being put out. A narrative is being constructed. Very few people are consciously aware that this is happening. The people who are creating it are very consciously aware of it because that's their goal. But most people who are receiving this are just sort of so uh, so grateful for any kind of serious statement about it from any serious figure that we're just accepting everything at face value and not really looking at what's going on. Why now? Why are they seeming to be ignoring all of the, the, the years or decades of, of UFO history and why are they seeming to present it as something that they're only just becoming aware of. Like Christopher Mellon was using this language disturbingly in one of his recent uh, interviews on, on Fox or CNN or something and he he was saying, oh yeah, and he's saying, you know, he was, he was very clearly implying that this is something that's only been on the radar in a serious way for the past maybe four, five, six years or maybe a bit longer, a bit longer than that. You know, but I think that they might sort of say, oh, we started to seriously engage with this in around 2009 or 2004 when we started to get those original, you know, those Nimitz encounters and things. But mm -hmm. I think they're going to what they what they seem to be putting across is that we, we take it seriously, but we don't really understand what it is, but it needs more research. Therefore, we need more money. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be trying and and and. and What's, unavo what's unavoidable at this point is that the language is all China, China, Iran, hostility, threat, vulnerability, defense, capabilities. The, and this is this is dangerous language to be using. So the, the Cold War is dead. So you have to invent another war. I think there's something to that. I think look, I think I think, you know, the American defense industry is a big, is big, big business. And um, uh, you constantly need a threat. In order to justify the the the, the existence of, of of a multi-trillion-dollar infrastructure, you know, mm, yeah, um, yeah, and uh, uh, whether or not they intend to pin that on, uh, you know, to demonise potential non-human intelligence, or whether or not they decide to go down a more conventional route of trying to talk about super advanced drones from 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 China or or, or, or Russia. Um, I don't know. None of it's good news, though, and 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 this should not be a debate that is wrapped up in militaristic language. This should be a debate that's this that this should be a philosophical and humanist debate. This should not be something that's that's that, that's just monopolised by by uh, by the military, which it currently is, mm -hmm. and um, it worries me. And I don't, uh, so, as as for the report ne next month, it could even conceivably in the next few days. Um, I think they said it was delayed till the end of the month but it could conceivably come any time this month uh, in june I, 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 they could pull the plug on that at any point they they've probably got you know three different reports lined up depending on the political climate that they could release um mm. I, that would make sense to me you know they could yeah. go so it's a bit like the moon landings isn't it nixon had two speeches right. one where they succeeded and one where they'd all they'd all perished mm -hmm. yeah exactly exactly and and so there's 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 different things that they could do. I mean, you know, on the most mundane, disappointing level, they could just come up with a report that says we've encountered these things. I mean, at this point, they they think they would have to they would have to at least confirm the statements that have been made so far, because otherwise it would just be too confusing. So, I think we can expect a confirmation of the fact that the military is regularly encountering objects of unknown origin, which appear to be technological and which seem to, in their own words, outstrip. Our technology going anywhere from a hundred to a thousand years, which is one of their one of their navy pilots said recently. Yeah, well, I, I think on that, and and you know, we're, we're all waiting for this report to come out. As you say, it could go maybe one, two, or even three different ways. I think that would be a very good place to end the conversation with you, Robbie. Excellent. So, on my behalf, Chris Evers. 
from Outer Limits magazine. I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and agreeing to uh, to speak with us. And uh, I look forward to getting some of these books that you're bringing out. Yes, yes, and thank you, thank you for your time, Robbie. A, f- a fascinating discussion, and um, I'll point everybody in the direction of August Night Press. You cannot fail to find something there that will enhance your knowledge on this ever-changing subject of that I, I guarantee and um, thank you Robbie and every success with your your current venture and things you have planned for the future well thanks so much guys I really appreciate it yeah it's been great great talking to you Inside Outer Limits is a regular feature on the Paranormal UK radio network <laughs>